Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Tape, a podcast that focuses on people doing right things in the mountain bike industry within Australia. This episode is another tech talk. Yes, we're back. We all finally got together after a bunch of events and a bunch of things that have been happening and talked a bit of tech. Before we go on too far, let's uh, talk about some sponsors. In uh, these tech talks, our feature sponsor is Lead Out Sports. Those guys offer some of the best tools, best workshop kit, best stuff to work on your bike. Pedro's is a good cost-effective way to get really, really good tools. I've been using their bottom bracket tool for a while now. Man, the machining on that thing is so damn good. It doesn't miss a beat. Like There are a bunch of bottom brackets out there and there's not much documentation around what actually fits. So tool companies actually have to make their own tool based on their measurements and Pedro's have nailed this thing. There hasn't been a bottom bracket, dub bottom bracket that this thing hasn't fit. So I have been absolutely stoked with it. And a tight fit's always a good thing. Trek, um, bicycle company are also on board supporting the podcast. Their bikes are amazing. They are so easy to work on. And when you slash, I can get that thing pulled apart, put back together in under an hour. It is so easy to work on and I'm stoked to be riding that thing. Um, this podcast is also brought to you by 100%. They have some of the best riding gear I've ever worn. Their goals are so damn clear. I've said it 100%, 100%, 100 times before, and their helmets are so damn comfy. They're one of the only helmets I can get that fits my big melon, and I can't see myself wearing anything else for a while. They are brought into the country by FE Sports, which are among the leading industry experts when it comes to mountain bike product imports distribution and their customer service is top notch tailored trails are the people to talk to when you want to go down to tasmania and ride places such as derby medina st helens or queenstown any of the good places in tassie they basically take care of all your accommodation they take care of all your shuttles all your transport everything they take all the hassle out of your tassie trip so all you have to do is ride can't get much better than that ns dynamics are the premium suspension service center in australia these guys have been doing it for over 20 years and man i can't think of anyone else to get my suspension feeling better than you their hyper performance tune um, offers better oils nitrogen charged dampers nitrogen charged air springs and low friction seals all for a little bit more than the normal service so why wouldn't you do it Frank Mountain Bike Apparel brings some of the best mountain bike apparel to the industry and to riders. Based out of WA, they offer cutting edge technology when it comes to lightweight racing jerseys, durable shorts, pants, and all their designs are super eye-catching while remaining simple. No more, well, clown suits when you're riding the bike. Absolutely love their stuff. Whenever I'm working on my bike, I make sure I'm using Crush Oz. Their silicon spray shine makes your bike polish up so damn nice it looks better than you and it helps get all the mud and dust off it next time you clean it talking about mud and dust dirt surf mud guards are made of 100 percent recycled materials and 100 percent recyclable they also offer custom printing so if you want to get your logo or your race put on a mud guard hit these guys up they're so damn good if you can't be bothered designing your own check out their amazing prints at dirtsurfer.com.au and man, Fist Hair Handwear have just released Chapter 18. It's got a custom design by a man, Baxter Maymeld. So if you have been thinking, where is the glove of a dog riding a motorcycle? You're not alone. It's finally here. Back to Maymeld's glove. It's over at fist.com.au. Make sure whenever you check out at these websites or at these web stores, you use Beyond the Tape, Beyond the Tape 10 or Beyond Tape 15, I think, on some of them. It's a bit of a lucky dip. I should actually just remember these all or consolidate them into one code. But try one of them and get a bit of a discount. If you have any issues, drop me a message on Instagram and we'll get it sorted. Anyway, we chat about Sea Otter Tech, we chat about suspension, we chat about bearings, we chat about everything. If you've got a question you'd like to ask for these podcasts, make sure you do it via Instagram 
and uh, the best question wins a hundred dollar voucher for Pedro stuff from Lead Out Sports, a title sponsor. It's been a long one, so as usual, grab beer, grab water, grab wine, grab whatever makes you happy, and enjoy the podcast. That's what we we'll kick the podcast. That would be good if we kicked an episode off of that shit. <laughs> oh, fuck. You know what we definitely need to talk about today is Orange offering a linkage on their new bike. I'm not I up to speed. Like we... I need to get up to speed because that's big news for um, hardcore Orange enthusiasts. I am a, I wouldn't say I'm a hardcore Orange enthusiast, but I'm a, I'm a pretty big orange enthusiast. I had a two, two, three for years, which Ooh. I loved. And I want to get another one real bad. Um, I haven't read a lot. I just saw the photos to be honest. I kind of skimmed the article, but yeah, it's like a metallic sparkly British racing green with a linkage and it's 160. I'm on it now. It's 170, 170 mil travel. It's a mallet though. So. Yeah. I'm looking at it now. It looks sick. It's so funny looking at like the leverage ratios between <laughs> like the old one and the new one. It's like, whoa, fuck. I'm yet to find their leverage ratios. Is that on their website or? Uh, no, nah, it's on the pink bike one. Oh, it's on pink bike. Yep, yep, yep. Mm. Yeah. Well, there you go. They're straight away from the, um... yeah. The linkless design. Yeah. It looks sick though. Like I, I it it's cool. It, it still looks like cool. an orange, which I like, but it's also trendy because it's got low things and all of that jazz. They've actually done it a really intelligent way. Cause that yeah, that link looks like it just Yeah, I don't know. It's pretty simple still. Like yeah, mm. it's not uh, not as complicated as as a whole heap of other linkage designs on the market, hey? Mm. There's no pivot staying... back. It's, no, it's just down. Yeah. You can see what's got. I like yeah, the... I was really um, stoked on that. I like the British green. Just uh, that colour's sick, man. That's like probably beyond the linkage being there, like my second favourite bit. Like, mm. It's cool. That's real nice. Common style Muckoff had a couple of frames that colour last year or similar and they look so sick. Yeah. I was so keen to get I was so close to getting one of them. Oh really? Yeah, just because of the colour. I was just gonna buy one. Yeah. Yeah. I like yeah, I would I would think more about getting an orange now. I looked at them in the past. I they were sick, but it was just kind of like, oh, like it's not gonna ride amazing. But I reckon I think it would ride cool. Mm. I just wish it had a 29 rear option, but that's that's me. There you go. Yeah, I can't stop looking at it. The Olin's kit looks pretty good. Anything Olin's Do they go good. on? Yeah, they go on so good. hard OEM at the moment. Like, Hello? who's on it? They're specialized. Like the new Enduro comes with it. Tranny's mm. on them as well. Orange, and there was, was there maybe some Norcos? Maybe Intense. I made that up. Intense, Intense yeah. yeah. Like, there's, it's going real hard. So, yeah, like the, uh, the Union boys are on Olin's this year, too. Yeah. So, yeah, they seem to be, they seem to be getting a bit of presence. I think they've kind of got to, because obviously you've got the two big main players like Fox and Rock Shocks, but then, I don't know, someone like Olin's has got a lot of pressure from the, uh, the smaller boutique suspension brands kind of pushing up. So they're somewhere yeah. in that awkward kind of middle. You know, they're not Fox or Rock Shocks, but they were kind of a clear third, but easily sort of taken down by someone like EXT or Formula or whatever. So it seems yeah. like they're really pushing to get up with the the, the Fox, Rock Shocks kind of presence. I was Which looking at pricing, have... pricing the other day and they're cheaper or on par with Fox in aftermarket. 
they they kind of have to be like if you're gonna like if you're gonna try and compete with those guys at all, you've got to have OEM spec. Like mm. OEM, such a big proportion. Like obviously, wouldn't talk numbers, but like <clears throat> if you look at business for Shroud or Shimano, like the the majority plus is OEM, and aftermarket's like a sprinkling on top. So you've got to get that OEM spec. Like DVO obviously tried to do that with Giant the other year and didn't work out. Amazing, you know what I mean? But like you've got to go after that. So I, I think it's a good thing. It's good. More well, people trying to do stuff is always good. Like only a matter of not that long ago. Like um, yeah, Olin's were kind of strictly no OEM, but yeah. obviously that kind of wasn't wasn't really working out for their mass presence all so mm-hmm. well. So I'm kind of um, I'm kind of I'm kind of indifferent about it, but I am sort of stoked to see them go kind of that route because I think um, yeah, kind of it not only sort of brings the quality up of the the boutique brands, but also kind of pushes on the big guys to Shram and Fox to to keep products good. More players is always good. Personally, always be a rock shop person, but people doing different stuff is always good. And Alan's has such a big name. Like so many e-bikers I talk to, like mm. like e-bikers are like because they're from motor. If they're from motor, they're like oh, Alan's, 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 you know, like that's all they think is awesome. So yep. probably a good time for them to jump into. I haven't seen it on any e-bikes though, to be honest. Stock, but probably wouldn't be a bad idea for them. I think there's a few Euro brands that have it because they ran yeah. that because that's where the 38 was first leaked because they did like that. Mm. Do you remember that? Speaking of um, sort of Owens and brand presence and stuff like that, though, like um, what kind of has surprised me, to be honest with you, is um, kind of the mountain biking presence in Sweden. Like it's pretty, pretty big. Like a lot of, um, like obviously no huge, um, uh, like it's not by any means a favourite, but I've been surprised even with my sales how many, how much stuff goes to Sweden. So uh, it's kind of pretty cool. That's so, surprising. Is that where the um, the Zwas are, or is that did I get that completely yeah. wrong geographically? Yeah, now they're in Fulham. Well, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Fulham. Yeah, Sweden. I just it spent sent a part to that city today. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, it kind of surprises me. I've shipped a heap of stuff there. So yeah, seems I think to, cycling seems culture pretty- as a whole is massive there. Like it just seems it, yeah, like everything. Yeah. As well, I was it. Yeah, it seems to be doing good. It's good to see. It is. So yeah, um, see Otto. I've been uh, I've been watching with a really close eye because I I'd actually planned to go to see Otto this year, but obviously it just oh, kind really? of hasn't out with um not to expo to to race i was going to go and uh basically get a get a free expo and just race my own parts but that's um, sick <laughs> but um yeah it was it was on the calendar it just really hasn't kind of lined up i guess for two reasons because um of the aussie summer mountain biking scene i guess like this first quarter of this year has been super busy but then just with a whole bunch of other, other stuff kind of have a, had a bit of a an epiphany the other day for a part and i'm like no nah, i'm not going anywhere i just gotta lock myself down for two weeks and, and get this thing smashed out but in any case yeah i've kind of i always enjoy seeing the coverage anyway from from vital and pink bike and whatever so yeah it's cool yeah i'm stoked that sea otters back like that like i feel it was getting like industry wise people are like oh see you know what i mean because it was the same thing every year and it was on the hill there and then this year it's like back in full force like it's fucking sea otter and there's new stuff yeah. like i'm flicking through some of it now because i miss heaps today but it's sick. I, um, like i'm stoked it's back. Yeah, for sure like i've never been i planned to go a couple of years ago and then i was really glad that i didn't go because whatever year it was like 2020 or something um i don't think it was last year but in any case it seemed like from looking from the outside, I know COVID and all that, but it seemed like a bit of a flop. Um, mm. And then this year, watching all the, watching everything come out, I'm actually really pissed I'm not there because it looks like, like you were saying, Lockie, like it's back kind of in full force. And I think half the reason maybe is that um, Innerbike has kind of slowed down over the last couple of mm. years. So I think 
you know, I think Sea Otter might kind of pick up their slack in a way. Yeah. I don't even know if Ender Bike's on this year. I thought it was done, wasn't it? I thought it was yeah. Over. Yeah. I thought, yeah. They've got that other same thing. Yeah. That other expo to replace it. Bike something. Like something random, like real simple name. But yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think personally I reckon Sea Otter will kind of replace it. Um yeah, I don't know. Seems like a pretty cool event. I think like the fact that they got Kyle Strait to do the slaloms probably increase their numbers too because everyone kind of loves slalom and whatever. So if you've got a good event to to kind of encapsulate that stuff as an excuse to to go, I think that's always a good thing for athletes too. Yeah, definitely. What's the enduro I'm saying stuff? It was like 30 degrees. It's hot. Yeah, yeah, the enduro was on today. Um. Yeah, a few of the boys from work over are over there and saying it's it's next level. It's people everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah I went to Innerbike a few years ago, twenty eighteen, and I thought that was insane. But according to like um, sort of some locals and guys that sort of frequented it often, they were saying that that year because that was in the casino, um, mm. and they were saying that that was kind of nothing to years gone by. And I thought it was insane. Obviously that's kind of, it's over already, but um, yeah, I think those big bike expos are pretty sick. If you ever get the opportunity to go. Eurobike. I went to a Eurobike once. That shit's gnarly, man. Like, yeah, it's just next level. And it's just eating Frankfurt and drinking like every day. And yeah. I don't know, it's just weird. Cause everyone has a party every night. Like certain brand has a party. So you can go party in that area in the booze. It's just mm. different. It's so different. Like it's so different to anything you see in Australia. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I reckon. Um, I reckon Eurobike could probably be because for people that I guess don't know, like Eurobike and the inner bike are kind of like the same thing, hey. But you know, yeah. Eurobike obviously in Europe, inner bike was in North America. But um, I reckon, yeah, the Europe one would be pretty sick because it's just Europe. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's just so many like little. I haven't been in a bike, so I don't know, but like so many little brands it's like yeah i don't know if you guys have been to the easter show up in sydney but it's like in homebush and there's all these different like zones for different stuff so there's i think there's like four or five different um what's the word not like i don't know anything better than building but like buildings for all the different sites everything so there's like a drivetrain place and a frame place and then the big bike brands like it's so big like you literally need a few days to go see everything like it's insanely big, um, mind-bogglingly big. And there's so many weird little things and like little, weird little companies. And yeah, yeah it's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. I really want to go to that Asian one. I can't remember what it is. It's in Taiwan or something. And they've just got... Cafe, f- like, yeah, that's the one. And you just go out into the back rooms and they've just got all the fake shit. Like the yeah, welded yeah, step cast yeah. for it. Like step cast 32s yeah. where the bottom's welded. Yeah. <laughs> that's what i want to go see <laughs> i've seen those at euro bikes like the catalog the catalog bikes where you pick the tubing and stuff like that's pretty crazy yeah. and there's like they wouldn't be fakes that were replicas i suppose like pinarellas and stuff but you could like make your own pinarellas like it was pretty crazy yeah that's pretty mental i'm i'm yeah i'm not the biggest fan of that type of shit obviously <laughs> no i'm not but it's interesting to see like the thing that's crazy, like carbon production as well, is like there's not a bunch of carbon production places. So yeah, like, yeah. It's not hard for that stuff to get out or the molds to get out, you know what I mean? So it's pretty interesting. You're like, where is this one getting made? Like, it's obviously not getting the quality control that a good brand's getting. It's just getting mm. smashed up with a bunch of Bondo. But like, yeah, it's just <laughs> kind of funny at the same time that stuff gets out. It's pretty crazy. Hey, like, I remember a few years ago now, but just like out of interest, I went onto eBay and just typed in like, you know, carbon fiber mountain bike frame. And it's fucking mental, dude. Like, yeah, it's insane, yeah. dude. Or go, go on Alibaba, like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway. And like, I've seen some of those in shops and they're scary, man. Like, I had a Pinarella, fake Pinarella once where you pulled the front brake and it felt like the headset was loose. That's how much it was rocking. There was actually the steerage tube just bending and flexing in the frame. Like, just yeah, scary, scary stuff. And you're like, 
because it was only five hundred dollars. And I was like, it's going to cost you way more to replace your teeth when you crash in this thing. Like, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like, yep. yeah, you can get a mold. Like, you that's awesome. Like, molds maybe like twenty percent of the equation of that frame, and then the rest of it's mm-hmm. like the carbon layup and the carbon you're using and like what resins used and what it's baked at. Like, there's so much stuff to that that people don't understand. It's not carbon's not just carbon. Mm, for sure. For sure. What's the uh, let's start talking about some photos and stuff? But what are your thoughts on that? Did you see the digit datum? The digit, where are you on? Vital pit bits. Vital, I would we'll just say Vital's got really good coverage of it this year. I think main probably because they're they're Californian. Um, but yeah, they've got really good. I will say if they need, if they need a photographer vital. that uh, doesn't take blurry photos, I know a few guys. Um. <laughs> I prefer like the pit bit stuff from Vital. Like I love pit bits, like World Cup or whatever. Like I lose my shit. Um, but they do a really good job. The digit datum for yeah. the one. With the, yeah, uh, I'm not really into that. It's a weird, so because people can't see it. It's basically, you know what it reminds me of? Um, Aaron Chase's old slope style bike where they used the lefty in the top tube. Yeah, to I remember that. Yeah. Mm. Well, sorry, I, yeah, I couldn't put I couldn't put a, a face to the name, so to speak. But yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So, because this was done a few years ago. Um, oh, oh, that downhill bike with that dude. Yeah, was on on name. Yeah, yeah, he got a Fox 40 and... Fox mm. 40 expansion and chopped it and did a very similar thing. Um, I have a feel I could be wrong here, but I have a feeling his was uh, maybe even concentric around the bottom bracket. I can't remember. Like, but um, digits has obviously got that link down the bottom. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's pretty cool. Is the question? I just I don't have, like though. the whole serviceability side of it. Well, there's mm. that, but. That shock strut is now a load bearing member, if I'm not exactly. mistaken. So it is. I think like it would all come down to like, I really haven't read up on it. My oh, it's one forty mil, they're saying. Mm. Depends how much FEA they've done and how 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 much flex they're saying is going to is that oh yeah, right. So that bottom link sort of sits inboard of the bottom bracket it's a nice mm. bit like machining or whatever that is on that this thing's smooth yeah i mean it looks really clean hey um the lockout lever is the best i don't know if you've seen it it's just yeah, underneath the- that's really <laughs> neat yeah i yeah. don't like the bottom well i kind of do like the bottom bracket tool as the as the wiper seal or but then I also don't like it's cool because it don't need like strap wrench, but then people are going to fuck that tube up <laughs> the bottom back at all. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And I think that stanchion is going to have to flex a bit, right? Cause there's going to be some sort of movement through that top link. Like it's going to go up and down if I'm not correct. Yeah. That's kind of what I was saying. I guess it depends how they've designed um, like what kind of, load capacity they've designed kind of to take that bottom um, or take through that bottom link. I Like, I agree with you fundamentally, like, you know, it, that will be the case. It just kind of, yeah, it would be interesting to see kind of FEA and force diagrams and um, kind of where they've put their vectors and all that type of stuff. Um, yeah, because, like, if you were to rip around a corner or whatever, you could feel that, like, you could notice that it's got a fair bit of stiction in the shock because it's just loading it up on its side. It wouldn't feel pretty, but that's mm. me assuming things. It would. Um, well, I'm trying to see and whether they've already done this. I, I think it's because of the internet, mate. <laughs> we just assume. Sorry, yeah, I've got my head in the bloody. Surely. They've got a um, surely the like the lower shock bolt is on um, 
is on like a ball joint so the the shock can actually twist. That would be my biggest thing. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like a heme joint. No, um, it looks like it's just a CNC machine piece that screws in. Yeah, I mean that like, I like you know obviously I haven't looked at any any FEA or anything on this, but the first thing that I would say say that they probably should do is put a heme joint in that lower shock mm. bolt. Like shock should come with a heme joint anyway, like in rally cars or whatever and moto, but that's the first thing I'd do um, because, yeah, anyway, interesting. Yeah, um, I like the theory. Have you seen um, Have you seen Luca Cometti's Canyon? Oof. Yeah, that thing's pretty, eh? Yeah, it's really nice. I'm a sucker for painted CSUs. And I like the little wood touches. Maybe I'm getting confused. I hope I'm talking about the right one. No, it a looks wooden like touch um, on a little fender on the bottom. It looks like those old that. 80s like surfer vans where they have those like wood yeah. panels down the side. Like that old um Where was that? It was like day two, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I was found it up. I just really like painted CSUs. Well, like the not the CSUs, to be honest. The um the crown, white crowns mm. are sick. White crowns need to come back. Yeah, I saw like if a photo. You, yeah, of, if it suits the bike. I saw a photo of it on Instagram. Like the one on Vital is okay, but I don't think it really showed um, how much work they're putting into the paint and whatever. I saw one on Instagram yeah. that was mental. It was kind of like an up close at the head tube. Um, I'm not sure what stem he's got, an I9 or something, but. The stem's really nice, or a BergTech or something, but the stem's real nice, so I rated that. Oh, yeah, it looks real nice. Yeah, it's well thought out. I kind of wish it had, like, a matching seat post, though, but that's just me. <laughs> like, not that I would yeah, in- endorse buying Fox, but Kashima would match the rest of it, right? Yeah, that's... yeah. If you're going to go Kashima, I think just Kashima everything. Yeah, 100%. FEMA discs. That's where it's at, mate. It's if you want that speed. <laughs> um, yeah. Who's your mate that has polished crowns? Uh, Mick. Dave. Yeah. Dave Happage. Man. Got a those... few mates that have done that now. Um, who, who else? I saw someone else do it recently. I can't remember who it was, though. Um. Anyway, I've seen a few oh. people do it, like Danger Holman that on Instagram mm. they've done it. Like literally like mirror mirror finish and see yourself in it. Actually, who was it? It might have even been him. I can't remember now. But someone did like a like a YouTube video on specifically like how to polish um you know, like how to polish your crown, whatever. Um and I didn't watch it, but I, I saw it on Instagram. I thought it was kind of pretty sick, but they went through the whole process, like, you know use whatever 800 grit sandpaper and work your whole way down to like wet and dry. Um, and yeah, literally like you see yourself in it. Um, but I thought that was pretty cool because I don't know, it is pretty aftermarket and makes your bike stand out for sure. It takes so much time. <laughs> like I had <laughs> links on my, the links on the um, habit and that was like three or four hours and they're not like perfect either. That took so long. And I just, if I had a press to press out my staunchions, it'd probably be a different story. But like, mm. that freaks me the fuck oh, out having like anything yeah. scratchy near those things. Like, yeah. For sure. I didn't even think of that. Um, and then, like, the other thing is too, of course, because they're cast or forged, um, like, they're not a machined finished finish underneath mm. the anno anyway. So it's like you're literally yeah. taking off material to get it back to smooth. Yeah, I had a set of crowns that were like a testing one when I was at SRAM on the testing program and they were just silver, like real matte silver because I hadn't finished them with paint. But yeah, it was surprising. Not how unfinished, they still looked good, but like they, they weren't a, a mirror perfect finish under it. So it would have taken so mm. long. It was at that point I realised, I think it was just before I saw Dave's one, um, that I was like, nah, <laughs> like, that's a trap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, for sure. I'm keen. I was keen to do it. 
Well, not that keen. <laughs> Uh, the I'm little actually, actually speaking of Chrome links, that little Chrome link on the committees um, Canyon sets it off real nice. I actually don't think I saw it. A bit of a squeeze. Just yeah, it's just below that lower shock mount. The little linkage there, they've just made it Chrome. Oh yeah, that's real nice. Eh? Actually, just to set off. Real nice. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah, kind of. Um, yeah, it makes the, the lines of the bike just look totally different, hey? Yeah, you know, we don't really notice that link, to be honest. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, nice cool. Bike. Yeah, I'm, I'm a sucker for aesthetics, like lines on stuff. I reckon it's, it's pretty cool. Um, like when lines kind of line up as being parallel and whatever, like in that photo, like he's got polished cranks that are running like parallel to that link and it, I don't know, it just kind of tops it off. His bows on his wheels are in the wrong spot for the photo, but we'll let him go for that. It's not the issue. Yeah, I know. He's, he's, not, he's not showing off the Kenda logos as well as what he could have. Oh, uh, amazing Kenda tires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what are you trying to say, man? <laughs> um, they've been trying for a long time. I don't think they've ever made good tires. And I apologize if anyone's a big Kenda fan, but I'm not a fan of Kenda tires. I ran them for a while um, and uh, like this is only a couple of years ago. Um, their, like their Hellcat was really good, like really, really good in like um, Lomi stuff. Cause it's kind of similar to like a, um, like a Magic Mary. Yeah. Um, had tons of grip in that type of stuff. And it was kind of like, I don't know, like the, the, the knobs folded quite easily. So it just felt like it had insane traction. Unfortunately, like on stuff that we ride a lot here in Australia, like <laughs> hard pack, hard pack, dusty shit. Uh, I guess if it was like real deep bull dust. It'd probably be okay. But like the hard pack, they weren't that great at all. Um, yeah. It just felt like, like squirrely under me, but um, for the Lomi stuff. Yeah. It was wild. Small That's, block eights were sick. I was literally That's about to say that. Read. Yeah, yeah, they were real good. 60 PSI, the dream. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, yeah, I'm happy with my Maxxis tires. They work good. That's not a plug. Like I buy Maxxis tires, but they're just good. And I jump on other tires and I'm like, yeah, these are pretty sick. And then I go back to Maxxis and my Maxxis is awesome. <laughs> I think like, yeah, Maxxis are, um, we're getting, we're getting helped out obviously with some Gucci stuff at the moment but um not that i tested any yet but um i think the reason why a lot of sort of aussies think that way too locky is just because maxis has just got such a big presence here like i know what you mean like i've ran maxis tires ever since i was a kid like bmx whatever so it's like anytime you get a set you kind of know what you're getting like it feels familiar mm -hmm. even if you haven't ridden that sort of tread before it just there's something about maxis that just feel familiar um but yeah, anyway. So many sick tires out there. Like I love the Michelins, like the DH22s. Really I've heard good things about them too, except for the weight being a bit heavy, but I have heard like good things. So um, yeah, yeah, the rolling is meant to be terrible apparently on the 22, but it's like, you know, obviously yeah. it's a downhill tire really aimed at running up the front. So. Sam's really talked those up when I was talking to him. I think that's pretty big and not in like a sponsor way. Like he generally rates them. They last pretty long yeah. apparently too. So yeah. Um, yeah, I've heard they last really well. I've got some Trek Bontrager tires here to test, which I'm interested to see how they go. I didn't like them before, but I'll see how they feel now. I don't think, you, I don't think you'll like them again. There was like, like back when I was a Trek shop, we had... I don't know. They went through instances where they were really good and then they'd change the trade pattern and they wouldn't be as good. And yeah. But at the time, I think like the, like it was like a GE five or something like that. It was good. Yeah. Is the team running them or are they like Sharpie? I'm pretty sure they're running them. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I know they were Sharpieing them a while ago. Um, I, yeah, current season, I'm not too sure. 
fun fact, because I've had to sharpie some tires before, wrenching for some people before, don't mm. actually sharpie the tires. Just cut out where the logo is and a piece of paper and then use spray paint. <laughs> uh, um, did you guys see the gravel bike with that new Fox suspension on it? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I like gravel bike suspension. I This is why I built a hardtail though, because you can push a hardtail. But um, I think they're cool. I think it's good. I think it's particularly cool, not for mountain bikers, as much as it's good for gravel riders. It's going to help gravel riders do more stuff, get a bit more rowdy, which is cool. Maybe end up getting them to buy a hardtail. But um, I think it's good. I haven't looked at the Fox one too much, but the Rock Shop one, I spent a bit of time on and we got it, Nicole. At what point does follow... it just become a, a hardtail mountain bike? Though? Well, and that's well, why I built a hardtail, right? Like, I was like, no, nah, this is stupid. Like, I'm just going to buy a hardtail. And the hardtail is sick because I can go ride somewhere and then cruise off stuff. But then I just built that new gravel bike last week because I got a raffer thing I've got to try and get fit for in two weeks if I don't get COVID. And um, there's definitely time to be saved on a gravel bike like in the position. Um, I did a ride over Christmas on the hardtail that was like six hours, like 150 Ks. And the position is not as comfortable as a gravel bike for sure. Like okay. kind of like this and you got to move your, like, your hands in, your hands get real sore. Like, like up in here for those long rides, whereas on the gravel bike kind of doesn't seem to ergonomically. Um, so I kind of get why you'd probably want a suspension to fork. The thing that was interesting on the Rudy when I had that is I found it had a really big range on the rebound side, which like in my head kind of need to be there. I feel the adjustments should maybe be a bit less. Um, but yeah, it was, it was cool. They're a bit heavy. The, they do bring your stack height up a little bit, which is which you have to really check what bike it's going to suit as well. Do you guys follow, um, like I'm a big fan, um, do you guys follow Jeff Kabush? He writes for Getty, he's from the US. Um, no. Anyway, he he's a mountain biker, but he does a lot of gravel. And I highly recommend checking out his Instagram because some of the stuff that he rides on his gravel bike is fucking insane. Um, yeah, right. And anyway, what I was going to say is I, yeah, I'm stoked to see him because he's sponsored by Fox. So I'm, I'm stoked to see him if he does put a set of those on the front of his gravel bike just to see what sort of what he can do. Because I don't know, some of the videos that, that he puts up when he's just riding, like obviously just – fixed front and rear gravel bike is pretty gnarly. Did you guys see the edit that they did for Fox with it? Like on Insta? I don't know who I was Kabush in it, but it was so sick. They're like at a skate park and shit. Like Yeah, right. Oh, it's epic. Like I was like, oh, so we just did another like gravel video where it's like trying to jump off stuff mediocrely and like they're actually hipping out of stuff at the skate park and i was like wow yeah. this is sick and like smashing downstairs i'll just try and find it i don't know how to find it but yeah it was for fox and like i was about to share it and i was like oh, i probably shouldn't but the um yeah, it was really cool like it was like kind of like skate video I yeah yeah i did it i'm gonna have to try and find this yeah I'll, um, Surely it would have been a launch. Actually, your we'll boy, see. um, what's his name? Not Elliot Jackson's brother. Oh, um, Andrew. Yeah, he does some sick yeah. stuff on his gravel bike. Yeah, dude, that wall ride, twisty, like not staircase, but like spinny thing we did, like on the one of the zip videos, and he's like going around a bend in like. I know it was a car park or like a spiral staircase, like goes yeah. and wall rides it. I was like, dude, that's hectic. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how I'm gonna find this video. I'll find it to you later and send it to you. It was it was really well done. It was like started off, it looked like it was in Philly or something, and they're at the skate park and like doing some like pretty legit stuff at the skate park and then went like street riding, found some pretty mm. cool like seat gaps and stuff, and then they're just smashing down stairs and it was my inner child <laughs> was just like this is awesome like they're literally just going ham down like massive 
like 20 set to 20 sets of stairs and it goes into slow-mo and it's just like, <laughs> like yeah it's pretty sick too good i've just sent a video um to sort of our group chat but he's got heaps of them if you want to go further back in the whole thing i saw one of him in squamish or i think it was squamish um a while ago now and it was just insane but um anyway some other bikes that you've seen from um say otter that you've liked Blocky, anything? I don't know if there's been anything else that's really come out. There was a stumpy that had some pretty cool squishy bits on it, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, <laughs> what brand are those? I don't know if from? there's anything else then. <laughs> I don't know, probably in the States somewhere. That was pretty sick. My internet sound was started to fail, which is awesome. Not really. Like I've been smashed at work today, to be honest. I haven't like looked at a million things, but uh, I think it was kind of it. Oh, um, uh, there was a slalom bike by, I can't pronounce, I think it's Yon, the guy on Giant. That slalom bike looked sick. Had a double down Minion SS on the back, which was pretty badass. And then McKay's new bike for Giant as well. Um, it's like that golf kind of paint job, mm. which looked mint. So that was pretty cool. Like it was cool to see something a bit different from Giant. Like I feel normally their paint jobs kind of fit into like a certain framework and they were like well out of that. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then Collins toolbox from giant. That was sick. I had a big, big appreciation for that. Um, I think that's all I've kind of seen so far, to be honest. I've just sent a, uh, bike. I've, I'm a big fan of this company. I've, I've been following for a while, but Contra bikes, I've just sent a vital, um, Insta story to the group chat, but for anyone that doesn't follow them, check out Contra Bikes. Um, as I said, yeah, Vitals, uh, Vitals covered it and they're pretty insane. It's like a high pivot. Just found that like gravel video as well. Contra Bikes. Oh, yeah. yeah, I saw yeah. that, the high pivot thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I um, did see that and I honestly turned away because I just thought of that Brooklyn Machine Works when I saw it. <laughs> Yeah. Like not in a mean way, but I'm just not into that aesthetic. I'm just not into that aesthetic. Like I don't know. I'm just the tubes are too little. Like I'm sure the bike works amazingly. There's just a lot going on there. And like Mm. I hate to say it, but maybe too much polished stuff. I don't know. (laughs) Like Oh my I I never never thought thought I'd say that. Jeez. I don't know. It just it doesn't like I don't know. I was looking at the thing you just sent there, but like the the polish doesn't fit in for that bike. Just saying. There is a fair bit going on. But can you see what I mean with the Brooklyn machine works? Like it looks a bit like that, right? It does. Yeah, I think it's, it's very just, similar yeah. to Brooklyn. Um, just I, it would be half the weight. Um, yeah, hopefully. They've got pretty wild kinematic going on, hey? But yeah, anyway. Um. Yeah, in other sort of not related topic, but it's all mountain biking, so on my mind. Um, and again, you can crop it out if you want, Darren. But all I was going to say is that um, I was part of the um, like Warner Mountain Bike hearing the other day, um, like the council hearing with objectors and all that type of shit. Oh, for Warbiton. Um, for Warby, yeah. yeah. And um, oh, yeah. it was... So I put together like a five minute little speech and, and did that, but um, uh, I won't sort of go into it because I don't want to make it all political and whatever, but um, for any of you, listening to... Um... <laughs> you you <laughs> no, know I so don't. Like, I'm not afraid of stepping on toes. So <laughs> you do. <laughs> well, I, th- I think it's uh, for, the, for the greater good of the mountain bike community. I just really hope it gets up. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Um, and there, there's some very... Uh, I don't know what you would call it. Um, active people that <laughs> want to dismiss the the project. So um, yeah, there's some gnarly, like gnarly stuff that went on with yeah. a lot of that. 
like just yeah. some of the stuff people were saying and stuff not from the mountain bike side oh, yeah. from like the, oh yeah it's like really like it was like clutching at straws um yeah and just having a tantrum which sucks but mm. yeah yeah it's crazy i want it to happen yeah. it's supposed to be big it's yeah. such a sick town yeah i was up there last weekend for a gravel event like the town's sick like the town's cool they've got good bakeries there's a pub, there's a couple of pubs. Like it's a really good place for it. And it does get really busy there in summer. So I, I do see that objection. There's not a lot of parking. So a lot of locals are like, oh, I might get you packed, blah, blah. But like you can build parking lots, that's fine. Um, but it'll be busy all year round. Like it's not that cold up there unless the trails get screwed from the rain, which I don't really know. But like just be an all year venue. And it's like there's a, there's a hill there that's 1K down which they're not going to build on yeah. that side apparently anymore. But like that is epic, like to have that, like you could have yeah. proper events there, like world-class events there. Like, yeah, well, speaking, speaking of how we had dinner. Well, speaking of how we had yeah. the other day, so the, the, the portion that, that they're trying to get through and the portion that's most likely to get through um, because the portion that's in the national park, which is experiencing most of the pushback is predominantly sort of blue green trails, but, the portion yeah. of which is sort of um, single black, double black and kind of pro line stuff um, is in the, the state forest. So that's more likely to get up. And that portion, they've got over 800 metres of vertical. So it's Medina, um, which is pretty insane, really. Um, yeah. I mean, if you talk about 200 metres of vertical, people get stoked. So yeah. And it's an hour and a little bit from Melbourne City. Yeah, like, it's insane. Even, even if ACOM was full out there, it's still, you know, there's so many towns around that you'd get ACOM. Like, you, you, if you had a World Cup track, you could have a World Cup there. Like, yeah, absolutely. It fits all the UCI criteria. So, yeah. Yeah. Bring World Cups back to Oz. So, yeah. 100%, man. Yeah. For anyone that's listening that's not, I guess, in the, in the know of what's going on, definitely support the Warby. Um, mountain bike project um, and support where you can. Hundred mm, uh, percent. One thing I think might be worth talking about. We kind of mentioned it in the tech talk thing. I'm still getting a bunch of questions about suspension setup. So I don't mm. know if you guys wanted to talk. Maybe a quick basic setup and fundamentals of suspension. Sure. Well, before we like, well, in this, in like, in relation to this, I guess, is that um, I think it's so important to to know that suspension, quote unquote, tuning, um, even if it's just as ma a matter of adjusting your clickers and whatever, is kind of vastly different for what you're trying to achieve and what discipline you're doing. Um, mm. Like, for example, like. Um, that event that we did last weekend, Darren Highline, like I was just riding my hardtail, and as like as an example, like I had the forks as hard as they would go, and the rebound as slow as it would go. Like the things hardly came back at you, because um, I just kind of want it to be dead. Um, whereas obviously you don't want to set up your enduro bike or your downhill like that at all, because you want it to actually handle chatter. Um, I just had it so it would handle big hits and not move in the gate. Um, so I think like, um, it might be a no brainer for some, but I don't know, definitely kind of off the bat. I think that you, you set up vastly changes depending on what you actually want to ride. It's the same, even like if you set your downhill bike up to go ride big jumps or like a bike park, it's vastly different as well. So, mm. um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I I'm think, um, there's so many people who want to set and forget, which is fine, you can, but I think as you're saying, Mick, like, you know, your bike can do different things. And I think it's better to have the expectation that you'll try and change it for different setup to get the optimum performance. Um, it's different to someone who's racing enduro and wants consistency. But yeah, yeah, there's definitely I think people need to open their minds a bit more to what they're setting it up for. Yeah. I mean like, like I saw a thing. Yeah, it was a couple of years ago now, but I was watching like a um, uh, um, a video 
uh, fluid function. So, because they set up Brandon Seminar's bikes and whatever, and they do a lot of SRAM rock shocks. That's kind of their bread and butter. But um, uh, they were going through sort of Brandon's uh, Rampage bike. And on his session, it was kind of like the predecessor model. But I don't know how much Brandon weighs, but he's not going to be a pretty, he's not going to be a heavy dude. And I think he was running a 700 pound spring uh, yeah. or like coil in the rear. And it's like, that's ludicrous on a session. Like no one runs a 700 pound spring. Um, but I mean, if you're hucking off cliffs like he is, obviously you demand that out of your bike. Um, but yeah. They um they have like a car jack jig made. Well, Sean used to. So Sean used to own Blue Function. I don't know if he still does. He now heads up the STS for SRAM in Vancouver. Oh. Um, yeah. So he's he's the dude. Like I've got so much time. The guy is the nicest human in the world. He's a very, very um, nice guy. They have like a car jack set up that they do to equalize the pressure in those slope style shocks because they end up going like far above what the max is recommended and they yeah. can't equalize the pressure with the dimple inside between negative and positive. So they have the car jacket up to get it to go back up to, oh, so go down into the travel to get it to hit the dimple and equalize. It's crazy stuff. Like they run such a different setup, you know what I mean? Yeah, he helped me out a couple of years ago. I had like, I had a, um, I had my compression dial fall off my shop at Whistler, mainly because yeah. Whistler just abuses your bike so much. Everything just yeah. rattles loose. And I was kind of yeah. a bit chatted. I was like, oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to find one of these. And then, yeah, rang up fluid function. And he's like, yeah, dude, got one, come down. And actually yeah. I walked in and Brandon was actually standing there. And yeah, I don't know. It was, it was pretty insane, but you're right. Lockie, he's a really, really nice dude. He's so smart as well. And like, yeah, he knows his shit. He um, mm. rebuilt my shock in Tassie just with a new tune. And yep. oh my god, it was like I was like, oh, I don't know how this is gonna go. It was like the first time getting like a, like a custom tune or like a different tune to the bike, and I was like, oh, and like first round, I was like, holy fuck, I was like, this guy knows me. Like, it was hectic, yep. man. Yeah, he knows his stuff. Yeah, yeah, like like the the bike setup thing. Like, I think as you said, Mick, the big thing is knowing what you're riding, um, and and kind of having a range to what the sag is for your bike. And, and this can change from person to person, but sag so key. Like I have so many people come up to me at race tents and they're like, Oh, I want to set my bike up better. And you're like, yeah, cool. Like what sag are you at? And no one knows the answer to that. Mm. And I think that's a really important thing to go back to as a consistency thing. And you can measure it in a different variety of ways and, and blah, blah, blah. I measure it with people standing up on the bike, but sag effectively is when you're weighted on the bike, it's how deep into the suspension you are. Um, and that's kind of almost like a, a negative travel or a bit of extra travel you have left. So if your wheels are riding along and then you say hit a bump, that's a, a divot, your wheels have room to move back into that bump as well. It also eases you into the travel when you're riding. So if you had no sag, you'd hit a point of breakaway and then you'd get jarred and then you move into your travel. So it kind of makes suspension all move nicely as well. And then recommended sag is important too, because bike brands will recommend a sag for you and that will give you pretty much the geometry you're riding the bike in for 90 percent of the time if it's say an enduro bike because you're pedaling and you're on it the whole time so sag's really important i'd look at what your manufacturer recommends um if they don't you know if it's an enduro or downhill bike i think 30 percent 30 percent is a good place to go um or to start at least and you can see what works for you um, if you're trail XC, maybe 25, sorry, trail riding would be trail XC. Uh, so trail riding to enduro would be 25 to 30. And then uh, XC would kind of be a 20 to 25, depending, you know, how fast you want that thing to pedal and, and not bob around, but sag percentage will really dictate the, the bob of the bike and the efficiency of the bike. So, um, sag's a really good one to to have it also negates the whole idea of of pressure so a lot of people i get at tents are like oh i looked at some pro bike check and i weigh the same as troy and troy is running 50 psi more than me yeah it's like yeah okay like there's a reason why troy is running that much pressure the the speed you hit something adds to what you'd call a dynamic sag and that's why i use shockwaves a lot with riders been using it with ryan a little bit as well um, to show him how it works, but dynamic sag factors in your ride position and, and your speed. 
Um, but Troy is probably running 30% sag dynamically when he's riding. He just mm. doesn't run it that soft when you're sitting on it because he hits stuff so quickly. So you kind of take the whole pressure equation out of it and then you can just look at sag as a number. And that's a way better way to look at it. If you think it's too soft while you're riding, there are tools like ShockWiz and, and all that kind of stuff that will give you a dynamic reading as well. And that's the, the average of kind of where you're at whilst you're riding in the travel. So I'd always go to SAG. And as I said, you know, pretty much anything over 150 mil travel, I'd pretty much be looking at 30%, 25 to 30%. It's a pretty good place to start. Definitely 30 in the back unless the bike recommends 25. And then maybe you want your front end stiffer depending where your weight's distributed on the bike. How do you measure your sag for the rear shot? So like what I position? do it sta- standing. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll do the I'll do the thing on the video. I should have brought my bike out actually. But um, I'm not a big fan of sitting. Sitting's a measurement, and you'll still get a reading from it. Hmm. But if you sit on the bike, obviously the back gets very very sag, and the front doesn't get sagged enough. So there's no balance there. So when you're doing it, you want to get on the bike. Um, and you kind of want to get into like a semi-attack position, definitely on flat ground, make sure you're not facing up. Um, hands in the bars, fingers are off the brakes. You'll need someone to give you a hand holding onto the front wheel or potentially have a wall there. You want to bob up and down kind of three times. Settle in that position. Again, make sure you're not touching the brakes and then get your friend, hopefully who's there. If not, you can touch down to lean down, move that sag ring. And then you want to really gently hop off the bike. If you bounce off the bike, it will just push you to travel and then your sag will be all wrong. Um, so it's really important to take for me, that you take that sag measurement standing on the bike to kind of weight it out a bit more. It'll take a bit of sag off the rear and it'll add more sag onto the front. It'll get you a bit more of a balanced feel. Um, I had a mate recently who was like, just can't get full travel from a shot, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. And he was just measuring sag from sitting. He's had way too much pressure on the thing because um, yeah. the bike was doing this. So, you know, mm. as I said, it's just a number. It's just a point of reference. You'll change it, but it's that's the basic place to start is setting that as a as a percentage um yeah i had to um sorry i got a phone call before i had to take it um what i was gonna say is like and again this is kind of nitpicky i know but sometimes i feel like sag um just for kind of like the general public is kind of i feel as though sometimes a bit of a hard thing to kind of wrap your head around i don't really know why um I think I kind of sometimes I wish that I think I might have said this in a previous episode, but sometimes I wish that say if you've got like whatever 180 mil travel bike and the the sag for that bike is recommended to be 33%, like a third of its travel. Sometimes I wish that that they would market that bike as a 120 mil like compression suspension bike and a 60 mm. mil of of negative um uh rebounds a wrong word but like yeah 60 mil of of negative travel yeah. um sometimes i think it throws people a little bit um because that's how you've got to think of it like you were saying Lockie, like if it's just to use layman's terms but if it's 33 percent sag on a 180 mil bike it means that when you're on it it's only going to have 120 mil more suspension before it'll bottom out, mm-hmm. but you've got 60 mil of upwards trajectory to go. Yeah. When you, you know, like if you go through a bump and it fall, wants to fall into it. Yeah. But you're still supported in that sag too, right? And that comes down to the damping side. So if you jump off something, mm-hmm. you've still got the full 180 to use. Because mm-hmm. you've, because you've rebounded out or depending how long there. Exactly. It's, but I don't know what you mean. Like no one's ever. It's the same with bike weights, right? Like people choose bike spec OE, and they use parts that make the bike lighter because they want it to ultimately be light. It's an OE thing, and it's the same thing. No one's ever going to talk their shaft length down and say it's small, but more of these. Yeah, is, you know what I mean? yeah exactly. And I, and I think this is where it gets <laughs> like it kind of gets complicated with bikes because like you use yeah. jargon from like motorbikes and whatever across to bikes, but obviously they're different because like with mm. with motorbikes. Um, you've got static sag and dynamic sag and static sag yeah. is how much the bike will sag under its own weight and then the static is with you on it and obviously though for a mountain bike I mean some do but very minimal but mountain bikes don't really sag under their own weight so yeah. what you're measuring all the time is the dynamic sag yeah. um, 
Whereas I would yeah, call so- that, I would call static sag in my instance, a rider on the bike without it moving. And then mm-hmm. dynamic yeah, sag would be them riding. Yeah. And- yeah, yeah, and that's where I think that with mountain biking, you almost need to use different jargon than what you would mm. in, say, motorcycling is because, yeah, I totally agree with you there that what I would call, because you're going to have, like, zero sag just with the bike by itself, what I would call static sag is the rider on it in kind of, like, a neutral attack position, like you were saying, mm. um, and then almost tune your static, uh, your dynamic sag as per what riding style you're going to do. Like if you're going to go hit yeah. that dream track, you might want a static sag of way less than what you would if you were going to yeah, ride real bumpy shit. But. The dynamic thing's interesting. Like having that on, I had the shockers on Ryan Gilchrist's bike. He was down here for yeah. the weekend, just on some local track, not steep, not that quick, right? His dynamic sag is like 20%. And I was like, yeah, but your static's at, nearly 30 so this isn't right you know and then we get to medina and then it's like bang on 30 32 and they're like okay mm. we had a bit more pressure in and then it kind of works but you know that's where i find that that shock was as a tool like yeah you know, i don't always find i don't always find the recommendations correct because it doesn't really take into account the human factor it doesn't know how you how your weight's distributed over the fork really mm. but that number like just as a raw number to take out like you take that to a different bike park and you're like i want this dynamic sag to be the same from track to track that makes a massive difference and i think it starts to take a bit of guesswork out i think yeah I, I agree i think the other thing is too that it um it helps get you in a ballpark like of course there yeah. are some people who might be new to mountain biking or whatever that don't even have a ballpark like you know they don't really know Dude, people high. who who ride don't have a ballpark like yeah i yeah. see it all the time yeah, for sure. you know I mean? and yeah. it's not a bad thing it's not that people are like being dead shits about it but they just don't understand it it's just like oh how much how much sag you have oh, i don't know <laughs> it just feels good You're like, okay cool like let's maybe yeah. set a baseline and play with some stuff and see like that's that's all working on suspension is really it's it's, it's playing with things and seeing unfortunately unless you have a telemetry machine <laughs> yep yep um and that's yeah that's why it gets so wild with bike geometries and whatever too i mean i think we've covered it before but just say with like high pivot that's why you can get away with running such less sag is because yeah. it's got such a, a large rearward axle deflection is you can get away with that first part of the travel not being as much because it's going to deflect mm-hmm. over stuff so much easier yeah my jackal i was like like i didn't know it was recommended at 25 so i was like set up at 30 mm. and it didn't ride bad and then i put a coil in and the only coil i had gave me 25 percent sag and i was like oh that's an idea and i looked it up and i was like oh this is meant to run 25 percent sag the thing rode so much better at 25 percent sag like i could jump it and stuff that i couldn't before that i just thought was from it being a high pivot i was like oh it's, yeah. it's just because it moves backwards i was just so deep in the travel thing was that long and my body weight wasn't really distributed well in that travel at the time mm. and then went to 25 and i was like oh this thing's sick <laughs> Yeah, well, it wasn't, it wasn't sick before. It was just better. So It's like I, think, I did the same thing. So Sorry, mate. No, yeah. Yeah, like I did a similar thing at Medina. Like um, my Supreme, because on the Supremes, I think off the top of my head, they they range from between 18% sag to 24 is their recommended, yeah, right. which is so low. Um, and I was at 24 and then I went to, and then medium setting is obviously in the middle of 21. Um, so I got a 500 spring, went to 21, and it was like nine day different, like so mm-hmm. much better. Um, unreal. Um, I'm even thinking about getting a 550 just to see what 18% would feel like. Yeah. Um, I think personally, I think it would be kind of too harsh, but, you know, we'll just see. Yeah. I think I think with the SAG recommendation thing, like I think people get really caught up with trying to have things stiff and, and blah blah blah. But if like if a bike manufacturer recommends to have it a certain SAG or within a certain mm. range, like definitely play within that range because as I said, like that's the geometry you're gonna ride the bike in for the most part. And that's what I hate with geometry charts being static in the sense that it's when the bike's up and no one's on it. Because the numbers don't truly affect how it rides. Um mm. So that's why I'd always, yeah, I'd always get back to the manual and, and check. Like it sounds really lame and boring, but manuals are cool and they'll tell you what to, the bike was designed around. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Funny yeah. You say I, that. 
I was chatting to a mate the other day that's like a really, really good mechanic at Toyota. Mm. Mm. And he mentioned the other day that 80% of his work is reading manuals. Yeah, man, <laughs> like, manuals are sick. Yeah. Uh, do you... Like, it's it sucks that people in the bike world, and this is a different rant for a different day, and probably around round four, don't think manuals are cool and don't read manuals and everyone wants a hack to try and make things quicker without understanding the fundamentals to start with, you know what I mean? YouTube will tell you everything. <laughs> Do you measure SAG with all your settings open? So rebound, compression and stuff? Theoretically, yeah, you should. Everything should be open. Um, normally, whenever I've taught stuff, I usually leave it in the range where the person's at unless the thing's stupid, stupid slow. So if mm. you slow your rebound off, it does have effects on, on compression. They, they shouldn't, but but it does. Um, so unless it's it's kind of like a brake bleed, right? The lever can be in a certain place. As long as that's kind of like in the half, between half and fast, I'm, I'm pretty happy. It'll give you a, an okay measurement. But if the thing's all the way slow, then it, it'll have issues. And obviously you want compression all the way off as well. Yeah, but yeah, theoretically, if you're going to do it perfectly, yeah, you open everything up. Then going from setting your sag and air pressure and whatever you, you set up and everything's balanced. Uh, what's a brief overview of what low speed compression does and how that changes your ride and how you should set that up? So we'll talk about rebound after. Rebound, I'd post up first. Low speed okay. compression, yeah. we may well do rebound first. Yeah. So rebound is this is so you've got your air spring on one side and the air spring does this awesome job at absorbing force it's great at absorbing it it's really dumb at letting that go okay mm. so if you don't have a damper of some description and you know at least from my experience of rock shock even the cheaper forks have a really basic damper system um there'll be some control over the rebound if you don't have rebound you got a pogo stick okay which it is not going to be great for the goal of suspension, which is, well, it's good in the sense it's a shock absorber, but it's not keeping your wheel planted, which is the ultimate goal on a mountain bike. So there's two controls on the damper side, if you've got them, um, there's rebound and there's compression. Um, when you move into your stroke, into travel, if it's an air fork, it's doubling in pressure every inch or whatever it is, and you get a lot of pressure and that thing's kicking, kicking back at you to try and, you know, move back out to where it was before air particles are they're all moving and they're vibrating and they get quite hot and they don't want to be together and they kind of want their space and they want to go back out to where they were but there's a hydraulic control on that which is your rebound um and that is is literally like a damper is a column of oil there's a shaft in the bottom there's a piston head the piston displaces oil so it moves the oil around and on the rebound side when that spring's moving you have adjustments that you can control how quickly that shaft moves down so the damper will have more control of the spring wheel on that release. And that's what's allowing your wheel to move up and down. Um, there's two different types of compression and rebound, and they're kind of the same thing. So low speed, I'll speak to RockShock because RockShock's my thing. And I don't, can't really say I know a lot about the innards of Fox stuff um, or other brands, but I do know how high speed works. Um, but your low speed is the adjustment you have on RockShock. And your low speed is, um, it's literally, it's a, it's a hole or a little orifice in that damper tube. And that low speed hole can be adjusted with a pin. So if we think my pen here is that pin, the closer you move the pin in or out is the amount of fluid that can move in or out. So the more fluid, the faster the rebound, which would be say here. And then the, the more adjustment or the more rebound you're adding, the more that pin goes in and the less fluid can, can move out of there. Okay. Um, low speed adjustments are at least for rebound uh, a semi shaft orientated so it's more towards the end of the stroke when you're going back to full travel um, and high speeds closer to the end because that's when there's the maximum amount of pressure on the spring um, high speed is a little bit different so you've got um, your hole here which is that low speed orifice okay and when there's a lot of pressure up here that hole will fill up real quick right so Normally when I was in two class, I'd have seven people around a table and there was a door to the left. And I was like, if we were all to go out that door right now, what would happen? We'd all get jammed in the door. Okay. So there needs to be a little bypass for that. And that's where shims come into place. And they're little side doors, like those saloon doors in a in an old timely, um, you know, American cowboy movie. And they spring open and the little spring. So once that 
hole is is full, they can't get any more through it because it's at you know maximum capacity. There's these little washers, which I've actually got some out here because I tuned a shock the other day. That if you are washing, kind of look like this, and there's layers of them. Okay, um, they're a little spring, and then when that overflow is required, they'll spring up. So there's a certain amount of force required to get those to open. That'll add in more fluid flow. For, so for rebound, it's usually when you're up towards you know, your maximum travel or above half your travel, that's going to be your high speed rebound. And then kind of below that's your, your low speed rebound. It's pretty, pretty kind of set in the way rebound works. Um, a lot of brands won't set your high speed rebound because you don't know you've set your rebound wrong on high speed until you're in the travel. And if that thing's set too quickly, you will get bucked and you will get hurt. And that's why RockShock have a really nice little um, system with their rapid recovery, which is like a Delta kind of stack system, which is like a shim in a shim set up like this uh, with a few other little doodads on the top that actually kind of make it a little bit quicker on the high speed. So I don't know if you guys will be able to see it. You need to watch this. There's a shim in yeah, a shim there. Yep. Um, and it actually is a little bit quicker on the high speed recovery and then the low speed kind of can level that out a little bit. So you won't get bucked and you have a bit more control on the, on the low speed. Um, on the compression side, low speed, high speed are not shaft orientated though. Which I can kind of explain. Does that, make, does that make sense so far? Because I feel like I rambled a whole lot just then. Yeah, sense. no, it's, it's good. Like, okay, cool. I think you're doing a great job. So then compression is a bit different because there's not a, a bunch of spring tension on it. Um, high speed, low speed, the, it's got the same mechanisms. So it's got a, an orifice, which is controlled via a pin, at least in what I've worked in, there's probably other systems out there, uh, or a needle as they call it. And then um, there's a shim stack as well. Now, low speed compressions generally are body weight and low speed movements on the bike. So usually... The body weight of the rider moving around, it could be a little bit of brake dive. So you pull a bit of front brake, the fork goes to dive in or likewise on the rear shock as well. It's digging in a little bit too much under those lower vibrational kind of movements. Um, but then high speed are usually trail inputs. So it's you riding quickly and hitting a jump or hitting a stick or, or a log. They're not really shaft dependent for the most part. Okay, so you'll go, you always need to go through a low speed compression to make it a high speed compression, but you could be at nearly close to full travel and get a high speed compression. Okay, because you're riding so quickly that the low speed orifice fills up super quick and then the shims need to move back. So they are kind of different adjustments um, and they'll come down to, to what you're riding, how quickly you're riding and the force really that's moving over the shock. Um, if you're finding, you know, a bit of front brake, you're diving too much, or, you know, really chattery trails. You find the wheels maybe a little bit too reactive, but your rebound set fine. A bit of low speed compression is going to help control that. You're controlling the shaft movement of the spring. That spring's pretty volatile in its movement. It wants to move in and out as much as it can. And a bit of low speed compression can actually control that force a little bit. Uh, likewise, with high speed, um, so low speed's a pin moving up. If you do have a high speed control, it's putting, I've got a little shock. This isn't really the right part, but the shim stack, you'd have a little cup that sits over the top and there'll be a spring that sits on the top of this and it puts more preload on those springs. So it requires more force to, to get the movement moving. Um, and that'll be for your harsh impact. So say at Medina, for instance, uh, Mick, I had the same thing, going through some harsh impacts. I was finding my weight was going too far forward and I was getting kicked. I'd add a bit of high-speed compression on there and that would allow a bit more control over those faster impacts for it to sit up a little bit um so kind of two different adjustments there that i think people get confused with a lot of people think high speed compression adjusts bottom out and it really has nothing to do with bottom out it may make it less harsh when you bottom out because you're controlling it a little bit more um, but it doesn't actually control the bottom out the damper has no idea where you are in the spring they're two different things one's a fluid based system one's a spring and they do not talk to each other at all unless maybe there's some crazy stuff coming out in the future, uh, but they, yeah, it's not, it's not uh, travel dependent because they don't know. I have That's a, kind of my rant. I hope that makes sense. No, it all makes sense. Um, just a random note. This meeting is going to end in seven minutes and 54 seconds again. Um, but uh, when people say there's a progressive tune mm. on their dampening circuit, how the fuck does that work? 
because the oil is progressive. always. Yeah, there are progressive and linear tunes. I haven't, to be honest, played in that space a lot, so I'm not well versed in it. Um, I've heard some really good things about linear tunes because it's still a spring in the way it works. From what I understand, it takes a little bit less ramp up in that spring moving up for the linear tunes versus the progressive tunes. Um, so it, to me, from what I've been told, it's a little bit more predictable damping, um, damping, but I haven't played with it myself. So I don't really know how it would look like on a graph, but it kind of makes sense in my head because that spring, you know, they are little washes and they would really start to ramp up in the way they want to kick back. Um, so it, for me, at least from what the stacks look like, it looks like a bit of pressure off, but, there are definitely people who know a lot more about that who would probably have a more accurate scientific answer as well. But yes, there are two different types of tunes and it'll generally match the spring and match the bike as well. So your setup kind of process is sag first, rebound second, compression third. Yeah. yeah. And what we used to do on Stu was, so we'd have a whole bunch of death by PowerPoint on the first day with suspension <laughs> and the third day we'd take everyone for a ride. And that's when a lot, of, a lot of light bulbs went off. So if we had like a really short little test track and I'd definitely like anyone who's listening, I'd go do the same thing. Go find a short track that you can session and do like 10 or 12 times. It'll take a while. So don't go do a long track because you blow yourself out. You need to be consistent. So we do the first run, we just ride down as part of the loop. And then we're like, cool, that's a test track. Let's go do another run just so people can get used to it one more time. Then we'd set their sag. So the way we had it on Stu is people set their bikes up however they wanted which was however they wanted. And then I'd make everyone run 30% sag, do another run, come back up, then we play with rebound. So I'd go, let's go all the way open, do a run. Yeah. What was good? What was bad? Because there's positives and negatives to both. Like people get really, well, at the moment, open rebound is really trendy. But for years, closed rebound was trendy, right? So, you know, what's good and what's bad? What did you like? Some people would be like, oh, when it was fast, it was, you know, really poppy and playful. Cool. And then other people were like, when it's fast, it was pogo sticky and the wheel wasn't getting traction. So you're like, cool, there's positive and negatives. You go to all the way close, all the way slow. Another run, cool. What was bad? Well, I felt like the bike was dead. Yep, okay, it makes sense. You're deep in your travel, it's not recovering. Um, what was good? The cornering was sick. Bottom racket was low, it was consistent. You know, same as what Mick's saying with Jules Island, like the bike was consistent and they're a little bit dead, but consistent, like you can play with it. So. You know, from there, I'd kind of let people set. Like, we were limited a little bit on time, but, you know, cool. Did you like it faster or slower? Cool, did you like it faster? Go one to three clicks from the middle towards fast. If you liked it slower, go one to three clicks towards uh, from the middle towards slow. Um, and that's a really good way to set your bike up yourself. Like, just go have a play. I think people go and buy these really expensive forks or lose clickers, and they never play with the clickers. Like, go play. With, they won't break. You know, you're not going to. It's not like the lockouts on the old back in the day that would blow up. Yeah, like go do it. <laughs> and then same with same with compression. Like, you know, if you've got high speed, low speed, or whatever you've got, like low speed's a really interesting one. Where as I said, if you're riding really dusty, really um break bumpy, like that little chatter you get in a lot of Australia, and you're losing front end traction, like try and put on a bit more low speed compression. And I think you'll be amazed how much more traction you get. Because the spring normally just wants to do this all the time. And you're just controlling that spring a little bit. So it's not diving into the travel and out every time it hits a hole. It's just kind of going across the top and skimming across. And you get a bit more traction with that. And same with high speed. Like just go all the way open, all the way close and see what you like. And, and from track to track, I'd implore you to change settings as well. Like it'll change because the pitch of the track will change, which is going to change your sag. So like I was going to say, don't sit on the bike and get your measurement. If you go ride a track that's this steep normally, and then you go to Medina and it's this steep, you're going to need to change your setup a little bit. You know, I end up going down 10 PSI and pressure from like my enduro setup at home um, to my Medina setup because I just wasn't getting my weight over the front wheel enough because the thing was so steep. So, you know, there's some pretty interesting things you can make there. But yeah, set your sag, do your rebound, do your compression. If you can set those by playing with the range, I think you'll be in a lot better place than if you just go set them yourself. Um, there's a lot of good apps online, Trailhead for Rockshot is good for a baseline as well mm. um but even just starting the middle is a good place to start as well and work your way out if you need it it's called bracketing like there's heaps of videos in that i think geordie does a really good one as well about it, it but it's just stuff. playing those settings and i think for for riders like the thing with suspension is like everyone's always looking for the perfect setup there's no perfect setup but if you can start to troubleshoot 
what you're feeling because you've played with different setups, you'll be all the more powerful for it. So, and then, and then there's the whole thing of tokens as well, which is a different thing after you set your sag. Um, maybe we'll get into that at a different time if we're running out of time. Yeah. This is base setup. I think that's cool. That's yeah. covered it. Yeah. I'm just going to stop this meeting and redo another one. I'm going to get a list of questions. Sorry for the yeah, background. I'm going to do, yeah. I'm going to do a quick wait. All good. Okay. Yeah. You do that. Seals. Oh. Landless yeah. SKS. How long have RockShox been putting uh, warnings on the stanchions to take all the air out of your forks before servicing the spring? On the stanchions? Yeah. So you know how they have I've sag marking? That. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Um, it's on my, li- it's on my, off the lyrics on my track. Is a warning sticker the same as like what, how they print the sag? Thing? Oh, but under underneath where the CSU would sit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, maybe a year or two. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because like, they had to do it when they changed from the, uh, so the old air assemblies. So that's a new like mm. uh, base plate. That's what you call it. So they don't run. They just run a circlip now over the top that and then it's like the negative pressure in the spring that doesn't make the thing rattle so theoretically if there's air in it it's really easy to take that out and then if you take that out then the air still issues out of you whereas with the old ones i don't have an old base plate here because those things suck um they were plastic and they had a little lip and the lip would sit yeah. in the gap of the circlip so if there was air in it you could still get them out but it was very 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 hard Whereas now there just has to be a few more warnings because it's super easy to take them out. Like, and I've done it with the old base plates and it was scary as fuck and now it'd be easier. So, because you normally do that shit when you're like in a rush and you're like, I need to do this and, and it's a bit too hard and you just reef on it and then the thing goes bump and then, yeah, you lose your hearing. Have you seen that? Yes, tick- I, I have. I think it was like a TikTok or a... a um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, Mississippi. Roof. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. He's like, oh, the video didn't tell me to take the air out of the fork. And there's just a, um, an air assembly in the roof. That's the best. I used to play that in stew because, like, I wouldn't get too many people with the fork fuck it up, but I'd always get people with the shock fuck it up. And it was people who were trying to race everyone else. Um, and I'd be like, hey, everyone, before we take this off, like, are there two valve cores on your bench? And everyone like, yeah. And I look everyone in the eye. I'm like, are there two valve cores on your bench? And someone would fuck it up every couple of weeks. And like there's 250 PSI on a bunch of fluid that just showers you. And then I was cleaning walls till 10, 11 at night. Like it was fuck. So yeah. Take your air out if you're playing. <laughs> if you're servicing everything, take the air out, please. Yeah, definitely. It's scary. Um, let's do some listener questions and then go eat dinner or eat dinner while we're doing it. Like Mick. Yeah, we've been doing um, this one's a bike fit one, so we're going to do that. Uh, thought on five Debs two bolt TI stem. I think that one's for you, Mick. I haven't seen um, this. Oh, they're the, are they the bolts or is it a stem? It's a stem. A stem. So it's titanium CNC titanium stem, and it's oh, got wow. two pinch bolts at the front. So the the ID of the of the bore is slightly larger than your, your bars. Um, firstly, like I really like the aesthetic of it. I reckon it looks sick. Ooh, yeah. Um, I'm up for um, any company trying something cool. I reckon they're doing cool stuff. Um, the only thing that I would say about it, and it's like in no way knocking the, the engineering of it or the performance or the look or anything like that, Two bolt designs I'm not the biggest fan of because mm. firstly, if you run carbon bars or even alloy bars, but carbon bars, quite often you scratch them getting the bars in and you've got to take your grips and your levers and shifter and whatever off just to get the bars on and off, which might not be a deal breaker if you're going to set up a bike and just set and forget whatever. But if you're traveling with the bike often like some of us do, um, that would be a bloody nightmare. Yeah, if you're on high rise like me, you're kind of fucked. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, yeah. I just got thirty mil, thirty eight mil tall dieties. There's no way that'd fit in that stem. 
Uh, as well, like you used to get with row, even like some of the row bars, like getting the hook through. Mm. Like if you see a lot of bike videos and they take the bolts out, it's real close and like it just scratches everything. And that's a lot of rise as a, as a bend. But yeah, it looks cool though. Like I'm looking at it now. I wouldn't personally run it. It's a bit too curvy for me, but it's cool. Did you see they've got one? I saw it today. Give me a tick because I think it was on the Insta. From you tell me it's got a Garmin mount on it. I'm lose my shit. No, mate. Yeah, I'll be going to court then. <laughs> no, that's a <that's> joke. <laughs> um, so I'll send this to you. They've got another one that's pretty fucking cool. It looks like it's a four bolt top mount. Yeah. It looks like it's bolted from the bottom. So the bolt Oh, yes. Top. I can get around that. Um. Four BMX oh, stem my. style. Oh, they make the crank arms. Oh, I know who this yeah. dude is. Yeah, okay. He well, was the dude at Shram, wasn't he? Well, no. Well, there's more. There's more to it than that. So, um, if you, I'll give kind of the in, inside scoop. I don't know how much of an inside scoop it is though. But five dev are a division of Fifth Axis, and Fifth Axis make all machining tools and whatever. So they're a massive CNC mm. company of which the two guys that sort of are behind five axis and five dev um, mountain bike riders, mountain bike enthusiasts. Mm. Now fifth axis from what I'm aware anyways, um, like I don't know, they're pretty well known in the machining sort of industry. So they, they're very good. Um, mm. But they, um, their new, uh, I Call it CEO. I don't know if he's di- if it's a director or CEO or whatever, but just for layman's terms, say CEO. Yeah. They're poached from Shram, so I think yeah. they've got pretty big things in the works. If they've poached ex Shram director, um, yeah, they must have some pretty big things in the work because that's not going to come cheap. Because they did that um, style of crank. Shram had that project with that style of crank. That was on Pinkbike yeah. a while ago, whatever. Yeah, right. yeah and he, I think he left us after that. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. Like on their Insta stories, just after that, they've got a set of diety forty mil bars going into that stem, and it looks like there's some pretty clear marks on those bars <laughs> into that yeah. two bolt stem. Yeah, it, it's you know, like you know, I'm a fan of everything, and I'm not not knocking their design or whatever. Personally, I just yeah, I, I really don't like two bolt stems. I like four bolt. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm the same. Yeah. Just seems like more hassle. It looks sick, though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, um, I would like that aesthetic on a road bike stem, to be honest. I like, I like the curved front on a road bike stem. I kind of like blocky, a bit blocky if a mountain bike stem, but that's just a completely personal and aesthetic mm-hmm. thing. Um. Here's a quick and easy one. Tool roll versus toolbox. Oh, that, why not both? <laughs> tool, tool roll, roll versus... Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm a fan of a box, if I'm honest with you. I thought you'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> both? Yeah, you've got both. Both. Actually, well, yeah. That, stamp, that story you put up the other day from you and the roadie, car with the tow roll on the middle seat was the sickest thing I've seen. Yeah. Like that made so much sense. Super handy. It's like a messy, but um, so I have a tool. So all of the workshop shit here, like you can see, I have all things in nice foam cutouts and everything. So I've got a tool box that has like 60% of the shit I need. And then the other 40s in these boxes are not overlap. So like, I don't want to buy two Abbey tool hags because those things ain't cheap. So I chuck all the stuff I take from here in the tool rack and then the box, everything stays in the box. And the box has a lot of specific stuff. So I've got like a pencil case full of suspension shit, um, like my box of random bolts, like all that kind of stuff's in there. Um, and then I've got like double ups of stuff that's not expensive. And then the wrap I have, which is the main tools, but then I can use it for stuff like that. And then if I'm going away to say Medina for the week or something, I'll just take the wrap. This saves a bit of weight. Um, I do want to get one of those Pedro's ones. The one you put up the other day it looked sick, dude. I really like that. The one I've got is a real cheapy. I get heaps of people messaging about it. It's it was like a thirty five dollar one from somewhere in 
Darwin um, or WA or something. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of like both for different purposes. Yeah, tool, uh, Troy Laffey had a sick setup. He used to have toolboxes with tool wraps in them. So you travel with the box yeah, and then have sick. a bunch of wraps, yeah. which was sick. But um, like whatever works for you, to be honest, like, you know, I like the toolboxes. Like, as a, uh, yeah, I, I like the neatness of foam, but I don't, I don't personally find it useful because I'm an absolute grot. Um, but yeah, what, what, whatever. Like if you can, if you're, I would invest your money. Like if you don't have the money to buy a bunch of nice tools, I would go with the tool wrap and save some cash and buy better tools and get in the box. Can I actually, can I just chime in for a sec? Because I actually won yes. a toolbox at a race. It's Hell yeah. Typ- in typical fashion, it's in bits. It's the what best brand? fucking box. It's the best box I've ever owned, mate. Oh, fuck. You just pull everything you own apart. <clears throat> so this is, oh, you can't see it. Um, so I don't get shit everywhere. I'll just pack some stuff. But it's literally like the bike, like the mountain biker's toolkit. It's got every mountain bike tool you could ever need. It's, um, what is it? It's a Super B one. I don't know how much these are, these things are worth. Oh, yeah, yeah. But dude, it's fucking wild. Like, it's a like, hard case. When I, got I was it, not I was expecting like, that. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I was no, expecting dude. <laughs> no, like I won it and I was like, oh, um, I just expected it to be random tools. And I'm like, yeah. I've kind of got every bike tool there is to have, but it's all, they're all strewn all over the workshop, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's got everything like tire levers, spoke tool, Allen keys, Torx, chain breaker, um, like bottom bracket tool, chain whip. Oh, dude, that's sick. everything. Shimano crank tool, like legit. I don't think there'd be much that you couldn't get without in this. But anyway, I'm hyped as on it because um, Duke Millington was in the race with me, and he won like a um, he won like a multi tool, and my multi tool broke the other month, so I'm down the multi tool. And I was going to swap him the toolbox of the multi-tool. And I opened it and I was like, oh, no, I'll, I'll keep this. This is actually pretty cool. So anyway, um, these guys actually had a bit of a presence at the VDHS at, at um, Mansfield. Like they had a full Super B tent. And they Super were B, like, actually put, Super B, yeah. They put a – I'm not even sure where you buy them. But they had like a full set up. They were doing tool trials, all of that. And I was actually really impressed. There was a few of them working and they kind of made a bit of an effort to have a chat to me and, and whatever and a few of the kids. And I was actually really impressed by their presence because... Um, Dude, they do no, really sick kits. They do like those proper fold-out like that, um, the guy from Giant kind of boxes as well. These are sick. Yeah, dude. I still I wouldn't replace. Very, like, I'm happy with what I've got, but as a starting point, it might be good people. Well, it's kind I of made they're me like that. Because... They're like the entry level toolkit. I think I had a similar kit when I was a kid, and it just fucking did everything I needed it to. I think it was like hundred. Kind of bringing bucks. back memories. Hey, I reckon I had something similar to this as a kid. Yeah. So we'll see. Like, I'm yet to see what the quality is like because I really haven't used much of it. Um, yeah like for any really extensive period of time. And that's like with any tool, I think the longevity um, really is the telltale. Um, mm. But in any case, I'm real stoked on it because um, like I have a race toolbox and it's like a Pelican case with some foam in it and I chuck all my tools in there. But the tools that I chuck in are predominantly tools from the workshop. Um, so but with this one, I reckon I would be pretty well good to go to a race event and probably just take that, which makes me be a little bit stoked because I can keep the workshop alone. Um, to keep Pat happy from lead out. Just... <laughs> Pedro is what you want. I was about um, to say that. Actually, they. I was just looking. I've never looked into it because I just buy individual tools. But mm. they do the burrito tool wrap as a starter kit for 175 and it's got all those tools in it that you're talking yeah, about okay. like allen keys everything you can get yep. it in a box 
or you can get the full burrito toolkit, which is like 300 bucks. And that's got yeah, everything. Right. Man, where was this when I was a kid? I'm yeah. just going to say, though, and this is not to bad math this brand because I haven't used them. So I don't know. They could be amazing. But yeah. the best piece of advice I ever got given from Chris, who trained me up really as a mechanic at Renegade and Park Bikes, but his granddad used to say to him, we're too poor to buy cheap things. And again, don't know the quality of things, but there is yeah. value in buying good tools because they well, last nice. forever. Like all my Abbey tool stuff lasts. And that, and I'm not even like super Abbey fanboy, but you know, if it'll get you going, I'm stoked. But it can also be good to invest in tools. That's all I'm going to say. I hope Absolutely. That happy, I had, happy to. <laughs> I had a uh, I had a real lucky one the other day because I flew up to Oshi's and in my carry on like in my backpack I had my um uh like my chain pliers and they were not happy at security and they were they were a park tool set so I don't know how much they cost but they're not cheap mm. um anyway they let me keep them luckily mainly because i was like look yeah shouldn't have had them i should have put them in my bike bag i'm just going to a race they're blunt blah 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 and they're, they're not like, they're not stabby them. at all yeah um but anyway word of advice is don't take your chain pliers in your carry on because you're not allowed to have them um but yeah anyway what i was going to say is those um that set of park pliers that i've had i've had for i don't even know 10 years and they look brand new so you're right. Investing in good tools is good. Were you leaving Melbourne? Is that where you got stopped? Or was it on the way back? Yeah, yeah leaving Melbourne. Dude, they hate tools. They've got a problem. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm going to put it out there. I flew across from Adelaide to Melbourne with everything in my carry-on. And then when I got back on the plane in Melbourne, they took they tried to take my Allen keys. Out Did they? Yeah, I, yeah, had, yeah. I had a shock, a set of pedals and Allen keys. And they took the Allen keys. Yeah. And they were flat pedals yeah. with like real big pins. And I was like, seriously? <laughs> I was like, cool. <laughs> like, whatever. I had a stainless you know steel pen in it? there that would have like is actually designed to stab shit. It's a bit of a survival. It give you thing. a lobotomy. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <laughs> random offset, the, but fuck. The one that always surprises me and has always surprised me is um, like I walked on and I do this quite often is just tie the chin strap of my full face helmet like around the like around the strap of your backpack and just carry your helmet on with you but like it's a carbon fiber full face helmet like if you put that thing on on the plane you could do more damage head button people than you would with a little pair of pliers i remember traveling once with a skateboard and a full face and i was like i could fuck up so much shit on this plane like (laughs) and that was fine but like my allen keys weren't fine I literally yeah. had my 10 kilo tripod on, like my five kilo tripod on there. I'm like, this is basically a baseball bat. Like, yeah. 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 Anyway, that's a random tangent to go down. Make sure you don't take random tools. Oh, you quickly flies, take them out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, last question because I thought it was pretty good. Actually, no, I want to ask this one because I thought it was interesting. Hey, Will, uh, Will Mick Williams Racing Products be making Crank Brothers steel cleats? Oh, I did like that. No. No. I was adding no, my magic. Basically, you said maybe. Um, no. So what happened was I was actually going to make make tie cleats, tie like specifically this, like titanium Crank Brothers cleats. Um and had done all the design the prototype whatever but basically another company had done it so i just pulled the pin i didn't i don't want to i'm not oh in the business yeah so. yeah yeah i remember that yeah i think like i'm kind of a big ethos that if someone else is doing it like i just don't really have an interest you know yeah, um, that's fair enough is a way to make it way better or something but yeah i've forgotten that company's name now though but definitely google titanium crank brothers cleats and Get on to yeah. it because definitely like the, the stock bra ones are shit. It's Silka. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Silka. Real cheap. I personally like brass cleats. 
in some uses, but yes. Yeah. I mean, like for people that like kind of want a bit of context, I guess, is you've got to have the cleat has got to be a softer material than the, than the metal bar in your pedal. Um, and obviously brass is softer than the metal. Um, but yeah, I don't like it depends. I personally, I've never ran crank brothers. Some people reckon they wear out just way too quick, whatever, but yeah. Yeah. I agree. Need to try some of those time pedals. Actually, they look good. Completely uh, like biased, but I like them. Yeah, yeah. Like I generally like them. Coming off Shimano and Crank Brothers, they kind of like sit in the middle. The ones that I've never tried that are actually on this bike behind me at the moment. Um, it's not my bike, but um, are a set of speed plays. Oh, the gravel ones or the road ones? Oh. Well, this is a gravel bike, so they might be the gravel ones. I didn't know they made different ones depending on bike. But um, is, does the pedal look like? Uh, is it like a circle, or is it look like a mountain bike pedal? No, no, it's just a circle. So they're yeah, like cool. I just so the road road ones. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I ran them for a few years. Did you? Did you like them? Uh, they're not. They're definitely not a bad pedal. They're more labor intensive to set up. So you've got like a you kind of set where the float is on them, which I liked because yeah. I kind of sat between a couple of different cleats, which was good. Um, honestly, they're a good pedal. The only thing that's hard to get your head around is the cleat is the pedal and the pedal is the cleat. So the pedals yeah. last forever. You need to grease them up a little bit, which is easy to fill them up with a grease gun. Um, but you will wear through the, the cleats on the shoes pretty regularly because um, there's nothing really to hold them together and they get a bit noisy. I always thought... Um, I've never seen anyone do it, even though there might have been people do it. But I always thought that speed play could have had a real impact in the BMX scene, mm. like BMX racing. They're super stiff, like super, yeah, super stiff. That's, that's kind of why, like BMX is almost in a way, like it's almost like track cycling, like just mm. lock yourself in and go. The thing that's hard for gravel on them is the the pedal springs pretty little and the interface is pretty little. So they're real easy to get jammed up and they're easy to also get jammed up when you're clipped in. Um, so just be careful with that. Yeah, okay. Okay. And then I think this is one of the best questions. I don't know if you guys have done it, but it comes from Bodie Terrell, who absolutely shredded at yep. Highline, by the way. Um how much difference does it actually make to take grease out of wheel bearings for a DH run as opposed to running them stock? Well, I think it depends on the wheel and how much grease is in there to, for one. And but, you'd like if you can maintain the speed. There's so much in that question. Yeah. Like, I know. Potentially heaps. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Like my, in the BMX days, I used to run my bearings dry. I did it for a few years. So, Basically, I'd pull the wheels down, pull the seals out, pull all the grease out, like degrease them, and then put WD-40 in. Um, some people use oil, like sewing machine oil. Um, WD-40 was pretty good. What you had to do is do it often because obviously there was it was pretty well just like a dry lube. Like you had to had to do it often, but they spun so well. With mountain biking, oh, personally, yeah. like, I don't know, you, you've got a lot of contaminants and stuff, like particularly in not just one race run, but like riding it, riding a bike, you know, over a period of time, I think it would flog out pretty quick because of the amount of shit you get in there. But if you were going to do it for one race run, like I know Ed Masters does it and whatever, like Pivot Factory do it with their I-9s, so they pull it all out, pull the seals out. Yeah, I know a lot of teams who run the same setup, like they'll pull everything out. But, you know, they're also searching for those one to three percenters everywhere and they've, they're given hubs, you know what I mean? So exactly you said, Mick, like if you've, if you've got a nice set of wheels and they're fresh, it, it might be worth it if you're going to look after them and just put them in for a race run. But then at the same time, if you're not practicing on those wheels and you go into a section faster than you were before, you're going to be able to hold the speed. And that's where, you know, that's where the big teams have the ability to play with that stuff because they can test on it which is hard. Um, but yeah, I, I would say to be, I don't know. I don't know the numbers. I don't have a thing to check that, but I reckon it'd be between a one to maybe three percenter if you did it. Uh, but if you got contaminated wheels, you probably lose a whole bunch less in terms of you get 
dirt and shit in those bearings and they start to flog out. So yeah, the other, the other thing you can do, like, and it all depends on the bearing spec too. This is the thing, like, it yeah. depends, like, if you're just talking about standard, just standard ball bearings or what what we're talking about here. I mean, um, because some guys, say in like BMX days, they would pull an inner, uh, like an inner seal out, but leave the outer. Yeah, yeah. Um, which kind of gives you half half. It gives you some protection at least. Um, it, it all just depends, but like, definitely, I mean if you're really searching for the time and did it and you want to do it for one race run, I think it would definitely take up, like it could take out a little bit of time. I'm not sure how much, like, you know, it's not going to be, you're not going to go from 20th to first, put it that way. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. But if you're trying to get from first to second, then maybe, yeah. like, sorry, yeah. I was saying like, that's a, that's a bearing there. Those seals on the outside, they're going to add stiction, I suppose you'd, you'd call it a friction to the way this bearing rotates with the ball bearings in the middle. And what he's saying is, no, no, it's a sharp, sharp enough pick. But you can take those seals out, and I've definitely done it in the past. But, yeah, you just need to make sure it's puppies are clean. You would definitely want to do it, wouldn't want to do it at a wet race. Mm. Um, yeah, they like, with BMX, like with BMX, it was so easy to do because very rarely are you riding in really shit conditions. Like, it can, particularly compared to mountain biking, like your bike doesn't see really any abuse. Um, like that's even just smoother from removing those two there yeah. and that's with the stock grease yeah. and, I mean, and that's just from that rubber seal not contacting the whole time it spins really I'd say there's more gain from just removing the seals than the actual grease inside yeah yeah because well, the grease the grease once it gets hot will migrate out a lot of the time as well mm. um, well kind of yeah, the mechanic yeah. was it was a mechanic at Norco Husby, Jill, and Bryn's mechanic. Reg? Reg. He was a fucking dude. But he would add oil, add oils to the uh, to the grease that would get faster over the weekend as the grease would kind of migrate out and mix with the with the oil. So it was like by race run, the wheels were like as quick as they could be. And I'm like, that's fucking sick. So they get quicker as they would get quicker. I remember seeing that video of Marshy spinning up a bottom bracket with a drill. Well, and so, yeah, like that's that's what I hate with all these ceramic wheel brands is you see all these fucking YouTube and not YouTube, TikTok and Instagram videos of people spinning bearings. And it's like, that doesn't really have a lot to do with it being ceramic or not. That's got to do with the ceiling. But for the most part, a lot of those bearings are kind of bed in at the factory or they're at a lower tolerance. So there's more give. That's what makes them spin quicker. But when they're in the actual system, they don't. Do it. So, I mean, like, Marshy is effectively wearing out a bottom rack to the point where it is at that nice spinny mm. point without the dirt, dirt and debris in it, so it's flogged out. But it's also, you know, half of the way through its use. So, well, yeah, I think that's like a really important point to, to touch on, Lockie, is there's like, particularly with bearings, like, and if you look up the spec sheet, it'll most likely be listed there is bearings have got a break in period. Like, mm. if you buy a brand new set of wheels and go out and race them first day, um, they might actually be a bit sticky because all bearings have a break-in period. Um, and like Lockheed was saying, it just takes that, you know, bit of tolerance to loosen it up. Um, uh, what I was going to say is uh, depending on the bearing, this is the type of thing, like depending on the construction of the bearing, what type of bearing it is, like with a normal ball bearing, if you were to just pull the seals out and not pull the grease out, it'd probably be okay, but I kind of wouldn't do it. I mean, half the reason for the seals is to keep contaminants out, but it's also to keep the grease in so the grease doesn't go through other parts of your wheel. So if I were to be taking the seals out, I'd personally get rid of the grease. Um, if you're already there, you might as well sort of keep going. But um, yeah, I don't know. It, de it depends. Like, you know, some bearings, like just say like a needle roller bearing for as an example, like they don't run the same sort of, Grease is like you know a double sealed mm. ball bearing. Um, yeah. You know you pull a needle roller out of a Chris King, um, and the thing's dry. So yeah, if you want good bearing, like I think to that point to Bodhi, it would be a difference. You're probably better off just having good bearings in the first place. If you want good bearings, this isn't a plug because I buy stuff from him. DIY MTB. Who I think's in Nowra or Noosa, one of the two. Duncan, who runs it, 
he's the man. If you want to speak to someone about fast bearings, he's your dude. He, I went to buy ceramics of him maybe six or seven years ago for a road wheel set. And he's like, nah, don't bother with these. I've got these really nice um, high, oh, what was it? Like a, a hardened steel. Okay. No, it was a hard, hardened steel ball bearing. He's like, they're a third of the price and they'll roll heaps quick. And he's like, same thing. He's like, take the oil out, uh, take the um, the grease out and put oil in. And holy shit, those were the nicest, fastest rolling wheel bearings I've ever had. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. They're, they're, and there's better quality bearings, like Japanese bearings, like those BBs, I just they're BB30 bearings I have here. Like they're really nice Japanese bearings. They're super nice quality. They'll probably roll way better than the stock Cannondale bottom bracket that came in that as well, just from a better bearing, so. Yeah, and like the other thing too is like you made a good point, Lockie. Like a lot of bearing companies and and bearing specs, and you can go into this like you know bearings are sized off off their code, um, so you can look up the code of a certain bearing. Like if you've got a thirty eight oh two bearing, which is like pretty common in the mountain bike industry, whatever, you can punch that into a bearing finder or whatever. Um, and also like yeah, look up the finish on them. Um, like well, firstly the ABEC rating is really important. If you're a mm, skater, yeah. you know a lot of ABEC ratings. Yeah. Look up the ABEC sevens, rating. Man. Yeah, if you yep. want to spin good. And basically what ABEC really is a is a derivative for is the is the tolerance. Um uh, but then you can look up um the finish of the bearing races and whatever. So like Lockie was saying, um, like chrome steel is kind of like standard. Um, but then like I know, because I use some of them here, Enduro offer their bearings in select sizes, but most mountain bike uh, sizes they offer in black oxide bearings, which are, mm. which are pretty cool. And what a black oxide, um, what black oxide does, uh, it's basically, um, well, that's not, it's the other laptop going flat. Um what it, it prohibits rust and that's the main thing that will cook your bearings is like if you leave it if it's got water in it and then you leave it in the garage for two months is that the bearings are basically going to rust shut um mm. even if you ride it again and it kind of breaks that down it never really breaks down uh, breaks off again but the black oxide bearings are, are meant to be pretty good in uh sort of increasing the longevity for your bearings anyway and they look sick Sick. Oh yeah, they look sick. Well, we've got five minutes till this one ends, so I'm gonna call it. <laughs> I think that's been yeah, a journey. That's been design. a journey. That's the uh, good one. most sporadic one ever, and it's been sick. Yeah. Well, Lockie, hope you get over the vid soon. I hope I don't get it at this point. I Jess is on a sit I thought day you had now. it. No, I don't. No, 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 no. I don't have it. Jess has it. So it's because uh, you've got the COVID awesome. shield. You've got the shield, man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> dude. I, I'm I, at this point. I'm invincible. I didn't get it in Medina at Enduro Jam. I haven't got it yet at home. So I'm just going with invincible at this stage. <laughs> I had uh, my nephew had it. Then my girlfriend got it yeah. for my nephew last two days, like the last second day. I hugged someone at Highline that had it, and I still haven't got it. Like. It, Man, it's the mustache. It's, it's gotta be eight. Yeah. yeah. Me and uh Reese and I had a different theory, but we won't get into it because it's uh PG on here, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's all the STIs keeping it away. <laughs> oh no, that wasn't what I was gonna say, but anyway. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, at least you're nicer yeah. than my dad. Yeah. My dad's like COVID just doesn't want you. <laughs> I was like, oh I've been saying the same thing. I was like to Jess, like, not even COVID wants <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can't even be part of a global pandemic, damn it. <laughs> um, yeah, too good. Oh, good times. Good well, to see you guys. All right, lads. Weekends. Likewise. Go for a ride soon. Yes. Catch up. Do it. All right, take care. There we go. That was our episode of Tech Talk. Sorry for dribbling on. Sorry if there was a bit of a break in there. We kind of winged it for this episode. See where it went. See what happened. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And if you've got any topics or any questions or anything, make sure you hit us up on the Instagram accounts. So you can hit up me on Beyond the Tape podcast. Of course, Beyond the Tape. Uh, Lockie at Spin That Up or Mick Williams or Williams Racing Products. And we'll answer whatever questions you have, whether it be about products they make or own or sell or if you just got general questions and we can answer them in the podcast. 
As usual, thanks to our sponsors uh, for this one. Massive thanks to Lead Out Sports for making Tech Talk possible. Uh, shout out to Trek for making the whole podcast possible. Taylor Trails, Every Sports, NS Dynamics, Franked, Dirt Surfer, Crush Oz, and Fist. You guys are amazing and you keep the podcast running. So if you want to support the podcast, support our supporters. If you want to support the podcast without spending too much cash or dropping some large numbers on fresh tools, uh, just tell your parents, tell your, tell your friends, tell your dog, tell your grandma, tell whoever's listening and uh, let them know about the podcast. Also rate and review this thing on whatever podcast app you're using. Anyway, thanks for that. And uh, till next one, have a bunch of fun.